My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in the portion of Scripture for our consideration this afternoon, our Gospel, we find Jesus dining at the house of a Pharisee under careful surveillance because the Pharisees are trying to find any excuse to trap him or to find a violation of the law that they can catch him on because they are his enemies. But while they are all carefully watching Jesus, Jesus is also carefully watching them. And when the time comes for the meal to be served, he takes note of how all of these Pharisees try and arrange themselves and jockey their positions around the table so that they can have the seats that give them the most social honor and acclaim. They want the good seats that are closest to the host to show that they're more important than the others that are gathered for that uh, meal. And as Jesus is watching how much emphasis they put on gaining honor and trying to show their superiority to each other, he then tells them this parable. He says, to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come to you and say, give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, seating at dinner parties may not be something that is very heavily weighted on our minds, but for the people to whom Jesus is speaking, this is a very direct sort of object lesson for them. And Jesus' point is an important one for all of us. So in the parable, he talks about going to a wedding banquet, an event where many, many people would be invited. And he says, do not take the highest spot, the place of honor, when you go to one of these things. Because honestly, it takes some real presumption on your part to assume you're the most important person at somebody else's wedding? Chances are good that if you go and you sit in that seat for the special guest, that your friend the host is going to come up to you and say, sorry, that seat's for somebody else. And by that time, all the other good seats are gone. You'll be disgraced humiliated because instead of sitting in the high seat you're seated at the lowest seat and there's no shame necessarily in sitting in the lo lowest seat except for the fact that you've just made a big point of showing everyone that you're not good enough to be in the good seat right the disgrace is really what you've brought on yourself by your lack of humility he says much better would be to sit in the very lowest seat so that when your friend sees you there, he says, oh, no, no, no. You must move up and sit closer to me. Because then even if he doesn't put you in the number one seat, everybody sees that your friend values you more because they're publicly being shown. You're moving up. Now, Jesus uses this example, but he is teaching us something much more important than lessons about etiquette and how to sit at dinner parties. He wants us to see the importance of humility because that is how things work in the kingdom of God. His final line there of the parable 
For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is exactly how it works in God's kingdom. Those who would exalt themselves, who would say, I deserve to be part of God's kingdom. God should like me because I'm a good person, because I work hard, because I have put in my time and dues. I deserve this. Those who exalt themselves are going to find themselves very, very publicly and very quickly crushed under the perfect example that is God's law as they are shown to not be as great as they think they are. They will fail to live up to the perfection that God demands and will quickly be shown to be not deserving to be in his banquet at all. And on the other side, it is only those who are willing to humble themselves and say, Lord, I am unworthy to be your servant. Lord, I have sinned and done what is evil and failed to do that what is good. Only those are the people that the Lord comes to and says, your sins are forgiven, and he lifts them up. It is those who repent and recognize that there is nothing they can do themselves to whom the Lord gives his gifts of forgiveness of sins, eternal life, salvation, seats at his wedding banquet. Because the Lord exalts the humble. And this is true throughout the entirety of how the kingdom of God works. Because, again, this is the way Jesus lived for us too. Think of it. Jesus Christ, the almighty, eternal Son of God, the one begotten of the Father from eternity, the one for whom all things divine were not needed to be grasped because he was them, he humbled himself. Not just to the point of becoming fully human, although that's a very large humbling indeed for the supreme God of all, but he humbled himself to the point of death on the cross. He humbled himself so that he bore our sins and he took our guilt on himself as his own. He paid the price for them as if he had committed them, though he was completely without sin. He humbled himself so far that he endured the full wrath of God himself the reality of hell in our place so that we would not have to. He humbled himself to be our Savior. And when he did this, his Father then exalted him to be King of Kings and Lord of Lords, lifted him up gave him the name that is above all names. He is the one who will judge the living and the dead. He is the great God, the ruler of all. The humble are exalted. And this is to be the way we are to live too. As subjects of that great king, the way he lived is to be the way we live. We should humble ourselves, not just on the highest level before the Lord, but in dealing with everyone. The life of a Christian that seeks to emulate Jesus' love is a life that humbles itself, even to our friends and family, to neighbors and strangers should be willing to set other, need, other people's needs above our own. And we should certainly never consider ourselves better than anyone else. You know, just because we come to worship on Sundays 
does not give us any inherent superiority to anyone else. The difference between Christians and the sinful world around us is not any inherent character in us. It's simply that we are forgiven. We know the Savior who loves us. He is the one who takes all of our righteous acts, which even the best ones we do are like filthy rags, and makes them holy. He is the one who takes the sinful behaviors and attitudes and thoughts that still plague us, even as Christians, and he washes them and makes them clean. He is the one who gives us the righteousness and holiness he won. And so we have no ground to exalt ourselves. Our humility should shine through. We are what we are purely because of what God has done for us. There is no room for boasting or bragging or self-exaltation except if we're boasting about Jesus. And because that is the way things are in his kingdom, then our love for him should move us to love others the way he loved us. And that's really the point of his second lesson to the host of the dinner party he was attending. We're told, Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Jesus encourages people who are a part of his kingdom to acts of charity, to giving and helping people who cannot repay. And again, this is the model that Christ lived for us. It was an extreme act of charity that moved him to suffer and die for our sins. There was nothing we had done to earn and deserve or deserve it. There is no future action we can do to pay him back for it. But Christ, in his mercy and love, had compassion on a world full of the wretched and helpless, those condemned to death and hell. And so he acted in charity on our behalf. He gave us a treasure eternal life, forgiveness of sins, salvation, full and free without cost to us. All simply because he loved us. And he wants that spirit of charity to show in our Christian love to the neighbors we have around us to the people we interact with. We should be showing kindness, compassion, mercy, love, giving help to those who need it, especially to those who cannot repay. Our kindness and goodness to others should never be done because we hope they will be good to us one day. It should be done purely out of love for God who has loved us first. And it should be showered on the people around us as wantonly as the Lord showered it on us. Without any hope of repayment. Without any concern of if we were worthy. The Lord's charity came to us purely as a gift of his grace. Our charity to others should be the same. And you know the craziest thing about all this? Is this giving to those who cannot repay us? We should do that solely because of what God has done for us. But 
Jesus tells us when we do those things, he will bless us because of it. That repayment will come, not from the people we help, but from the Lord on the day of the resurrection of the righteous on Judgment Day. Our Lord remembers our acts of kindness and charity to others as if they were done to him. And he promises to bless us for it, to reward us for it. And we aren't told what that is exactly. But even if it's as simple as the Lord saying, thank you for your act of charity, this is a thank you from the God of all, the creator of the universe, the one from whom we are unworthy to stand, showing such kindness and mercy and gratefulness to his people. This is astonishing. That our Lord's love for us is not mere servants, but that he makes us his family. That he lifts us up so high that he would bless above and beyond what he has already done. Truly, the love of our God is overflowing with abundance. And so, my brothers and sisters, as we go about our weeks, let us live lives of humility and charity, lives that are reflective of the love Christ has shown us. Let us show his love to others in our words, for sure, but also in our actions so that the same love that has been poured out so lavishly on us might pour out from us to others. All because Jesus loved us first. Amen.